All right. Well, it is time for us to uh, get started here on this uh, day of Pentecost. We're on the sixth day of the third month, the end of the Omer count, the day of Pentecost, when it appears that the law was given to Israel, and of course, the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples of the New Testament church. Like to uh, start services by asking Mr. Daly if he would please open in prayer. James? Yes, thank you. Our Father, Yehovah, the Maker of all that exists, the universe, and the micro universe everything that was made was made by you we give you the greatest appreciation for the fact that you have set in place a process of reconciliation for the living parts of your creation that you give given your way of life and your law and you neglected to follow it you know, you prepared this for mankind's liberty and safety and security. We know quite clearly that those of us who have repented, been baptized, received your Holy Spirit, don't act in a way that would cause you to suppress your spirit. Please fill us all up to overflowing as we are more in tune with your way of thinking and the proper frequency of that tune so we can live our lives in, on the same key that you have given us. These uh, different things that are starting to control our thinking and our thoughts as part of this assault on us is having a significant effect and impact. If you please also protect us from what is being put upon us and our bodies and more especially our minds but with this uh, programming that is being assaulted with us. You know what is being done to man and your people if you could make us aware what the enemy of man, the, uh, the false accuser is doing to us so that we can better protect ourselves and be good witnesses of your way of life and a good witness to the whole world and that we can stand up and take what's given to us. But... Uh, our greatest appreciation for the feast days that you very clearly lay out your plan of salvation. We give you thanks that this plan is put into place. We regret that we're part of the problem. We would ask for the spirit to be retained by us could use it more effectively and be better witnesses. So we ask for all of this, please. In the authority of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen to that. Thank you, James. If you will all remain standing, you can take up your hymnals. Open to page 123, all the way toward the back. We will uh, have our first hymn, titled, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. And this is uh, from uh, Franz Joseph Hayden. I believe this is in the same uh, melody as uh, the German National Anthem, but it's a beautiful hymn. 
Glorious things of thee are spoken, page Okay, that should have us uh, up and awake now, early in the morning on this Pentecost day. If you'll turn back a couple of pages, a few pages, to page 117. On page 117, we'll sing a hymn that comes from 2 Samuel 22, titled, Thee Will I Love, O Yah. That's on page 22, Thee Will I Love, O Yah after which we'll turn the mic over to Mr. Wes Head to read in the book of 2 Corinthians chapters 4 through 6. My great salvation, my high. 
Okay. If you'll all be seated now, we'll turn the mic over to Mr. West to read in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapters 4 through 6. Wes, over to you. Thank you, Dave. Chapter 4. It starts out, it says, treasures in jars of clay. Well, what is that all about? Therefore, since through God, mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secrets and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the, distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commence ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is vile, it is vile to those who are per perishing. The word of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of, of the glory of Christ, who is so that they can, so that the image of God, for we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness. Make his light shine in your hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay so to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not cursed, crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also reveal in our bodies. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that my, his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then death is at work in us but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit. So that the, got to turn the page. Come on, 25, 26. Grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and our momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Chapter 5 our heavenly dwelling. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, but built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwellings, because we, when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be 
unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwellings, so that what is mortal may be swelled up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident. I say and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now let me get this off my screen. The ministry of reconciliation, verse 11. Since then, we know what is sits to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men what we are in plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to command ourselves to you, you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. It is, if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. And therefore, all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to, to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciled in the world to himself in Christ. Now counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that he, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Chapter 6. As God follow works, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. I tell you now, in the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. Paul's hardships on verse 3. We put no st st stumbling blocks in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in trouble, hardships, and distress, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots and hard work, sleepless nights and hunger and impurities, understanding, patience, and kindness in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love and truth, speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad reports and good reports. Genuine yet regarded as imposters, imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beating and yet not killed, 
sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you. From you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. Do not be yoked with unbelievers. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Baal? What does a believer have in common with the unbeliever? What agreements is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore come out from them and be separate. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my son and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Well, the end. All right, back at you, Dave. Thank you, Wes. As always, we appreciate that uh, reading of Scripture. Always uh, animated. It's, uh, Paul's writings are very interesting. I was reading through some of the Book of Romans yesterday, and you really have to read through his stuff many times and put on your thinking cap, as it were, because uh, his writings are somewhat difficult sometimes, but he had a great understanding, so it's, it's a good thing to uh, read his writings and, and uh, attempt to understand them anyway. Okay, if you'll stand one more time and open your hymnals to page 115, we'll sing a hymn that comes from an unknown author, actually titled, uh, Come Thou Almighty King, and, uh, well, I guess it's from Felice D. Giardini. Anyway, Come Thou Almighty King, page 115, after which we'll have our main message, uh, which is the, the subject of Pentecost, brought to us by Mr. James Daly.
Okay, if you'll all be seated now, we will now have our main message on this Pentecost morning, titled Pentecost, brought to us by Mr. James Daly. Okay, good morning to uh, everyone and happy Pentecost. Um, sometimes you'll see in scripture we're talking about this day being fully come or completely come, that type of thing, because um, in um, ancient times, of course, there was no problem with back to back Sabbaths. It's only uh, later rabbinical uh, authorities that tried to pull in days so you didn't have two back to back Sabbaths, but historically, the day of Pentecost was always held on the first day of the week, and it was uh, always as a back-to-back -back Sabbath, therefore. So uh, I think maybe I'd like to start with the Philippians 3, 1 to 11. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me. It is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the false circumcision. And amongst the, uh, for we, meaning the first century Christians who were being persecuted by the principally and, and secondarily by the Trinitarians once they got power, we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God, glory in Jesus Christ, and put no confidence in the flesh. So you can see here that the acceptable worship of God is with or using his spirit is put in us from our baptism and uh, we have to use it appropriately and effectively and uh, the more correctly we use it uh, the more of God's spirit will, will remain in us and with us so I myself, this is Paul I might have a verse 4 I might have confidence in the flesh if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh I have more I'm circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel. And the term there, nation, is a, from a word that uh, just as easily can mean um, family. So you're talking about a, a family of the descendants of Israel. Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin that was part of the, the family of Israel that had been reassigned by God with, from Judah. They remained with Judah. But as you can see, he's sometimes called a Jew, uh, um, Paul, but uh, he considers himself part of the family of Israel primarily, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. For more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them all as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So you can see what he was talking about, that he, he believed he was keeping the, uh, the letter of the law and the um, physical components of the, of the uh, sacrificial legislation of the the law that was uh, tied to the covenant, but uh, later understood that, that he had not been understanding and applying it correctly and viewing it through the Spirit, which after he received the Spirit, after his baptism and the hands were laid on that he received the Spirit and he regained his sight, uh, he, he understood uh, the difficulty in, in what he had been proclaiming and doing. So anyway, uh, that uh, I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of this faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his sufferings. And this uh, aspect of sufferings was one of the uh, mikvahs that were, of the six mikvahs that were handled and we're calling them baptisms which were taking place before people entered the physical temple you would be in these uh, cleansing but they had other other features to them and one of which was sufferings uh, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead so he 
Paul here is considering that that uh, although he was keeping the physical components of the law correctly, he says found blameless, uh, but uh, consider that all rubbish once he understood through the receipt of the Spirit of God uh, basically what Jesus Christ was talking about. You know, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I tell you to do? You call me Lord because you want, you know, physical salvation, but you don't do it or apply the law the way I'm explaining it. So... I guess we all understand that, that uh, all of Scripture has uh, various components to it that sort of all need to be tied together to get the whole picture because there's a tendency just to select uh, certain versions or certain pictures that, that we get from Scripture and not apply it properly. So this day basically is related to the, the Church of God and uh, the Temple of God as the Naos and its receipt of the Holy Spirit through which it properly keeps and the law of God minus the physical sacrificial components which were fulfilled through Christ's acceptable sacrifice and not through us offering uh, one-year-old lambs or birds for our sins. So uh, the word is Greek, Pentecosta, means 50 count. So we would understand that in English as, as counting to 50, which we have just done. You count from the day of the wave chief offering, which is uh, happens on the first day of the week, termed Sunday, during the days of unleavened bread. A lot of these features of the calendar really are quite simple. Uh, they're made difficult and complicated because of the number of different opinions on them and assaults on them. At the, at the time, uh, shortly after this, that Paul's writing here, the Pharisees were attempting to change the date to Pentecost to uh, Sivan 6, meaning you're, you're counting from the, the day after the, the Passover or the first day of unleavened bread, which Scripture doesn't say, but they have convinced uh, a huge millions of people that that's the fact and uh, are, are leaving all of the calendar issues because the Jews can't really solve it amongst themselves anymore because it's too contestable. But uh, this count comes from the first day of the week, and there's uh, only one that falls in the days of unleavened bread. It's the day after the Sabbath. So you're counting seven full weeks. So seven times seven, 49. You will then end up on the first day of the week, our modern day Sunday. And uh, this is an unusual year because you have all the Trinitarians and the Catholics and Protestants and almost everybody actually keeping this on the, on the same and correct day. The uh, Catholics and Protestants kept um, Easter Sunday on the w day, the correct day of the wave chief offering during the days of unleavened bread this year, so it was a bit of an unusual. That's how we get to this day, and it has nothing to do really with how everybody else happens to be using the same day this, this year. So it's the first day of the week, a modern-day Sunday, counted from the Sunday or the first day of the week, started during the Days of Unleavened Bread, which was the day of the wave chief offering, which uh, on occasion was a... So if it was grain that, that wasn't mature enough that where it could be ground on its own, they would have to parch it to, to get it to, a, to where they would be able to grind it. They would put it into a, into a vase close to a quart size and uh, called an omer and then uh, wave that before God on the morning of this day which is why Jesus Christ at the day of his sacrifice on the afternoon of the 14th not at, not at dark to dark at the beginning of the 14th but on the afternoon at, at 3 in the afternoon on the day of the 14th that's when the sacrifices take place they didn't take, take place at uh, twilight or any other time. They took place at, at uh, 9 and 3 a.m. during the daylight period on the 14th. So uh, he then died at the time the uh, lambs were being slaughtered and then is uh, stated to be our Passover lamb. So the, the New Covenant believers' Passover is is uh, through Jesus Christ's acceptable sacrifice. He would then was in the grave for three days and three nights completely, so not two and a half days or, or, or any parts of days, but three days and three nights completely. 
So at the from the end of uh, of the uh, preparation day on the 14th uh, to uh, the end of of uh, what would be a Sabbath at the days of unleavened bread in in 30 A.D. Uh, he rose. Miriam or Mary uh, saw him on the next morning, but he didn't let her touch him because he was waiting to ascend to his God and Father for his acceptance and for our benefit, or for the covering of our, our sins, a payment for our sins, not covering, but a complete and total payment of our bill of indebtedness, carigraphon. So he paid for that through a sacrifice, but he, God does everything on time and uh, in a very specific way, but this time burned. So uh, Mary wasn't allowed to touch him. He was waiting to ascend, uh, and we would take that to be the third hour. So that's the third hour from the from on the uh, day of the wave chief offering at the time the Omer Omer ground grain, or if the grains hadn't could couldn't have been grown to a head or were not able to be parched, uh, the the green ears or the green sheaves were waved, even though they wouldn't be able to eat it. Uh, you're not allowed to eat any new corn, or translated as corn, but um, new grain uh, would have been barley in the, in the Middle East and in Egypt at the time. Uh, you can't eat any of the new. You had to eat what's called old corn or old grain, and that doesn't mean necessarily old, but uh, stored. So you couldn't eat any stored grain that they would have kept and, and should have had years, years of grains on hand. And that's what they'd be eating. After the wave chief was uh, accepted from that time, you could eat the new new grain, which, of course, is much fresher. And when you're making it into breads and things, it's, it tastes a lot better. But in any event, during uh, the days of unleavened bread, they would have been using this primarily parched grain. and um, But uh, baking it unleavened, they wouldn't have added any uh, yeast to it to for uh, or any other flavoring. It was just uh, the ground grain, oil, and salt, and uh, baked on leaven. So you count to 50, and uh, this is the day. And uh, they believe they discovered the actual cracked mountain at Sinai because it's often put into uh, territories in Judea or, or what's claimed by, by modern Judea or the Jews. But actually, I think it's been found and understood to be in, uh, in uh, northwest um, Saudi Arabia, which fits uh, perfectly with the with the account of when Israelites out <coughs> of Egypt after they had left and taken uh, what they took from the Egyptians a bit later than uh, they were being followed or pursued. And uh, Moses led them down to the water, and the place where they were was uh, actually a contained area. If you see where it is on the video, you can see some of what Moses was talking about as to where there's, you know, there's no place to escape. Uh, the area along the bank of the of the sea was was uh, had a buffer at each end of it, so they were completely contained and and really would have been at the mercy of the, of the troops of Pharaoh. And the miracle then took place, and the sea was divided, and these uh, Israelites then crossed the water, basically into where modern Saudi Arabia is. And uh, the the video of, of where the uh, this uh, mountain, or it's not a mountain really to our mind, but uh, a mount is, is uh, quite interesting. It's been actually fenced off by the king of Saudi Arabia, so people can't get into it because when it was uh, understood because, you see, they also, when they went into the water there, it's a, well, sort of 160 or 80 feet deep, they found uh, ancient chariot wheels. They found bones. And so evidence from Pharaoh's army, which was, I believe, I, I'm not sure if I've got this right, estimated to be close to a quarter of a million people. Pharaoh had a huge population, formidable presence. And... Uh, you can maybe verify that a bit later, but when you see it on video where the Israelites were contained, where they went across the water into um, uh, modern, where modern Saudi Arabia is, 
it's um, interesting, and it's, it's very interesting when logical research uh, continually verifies scriptural statements that aren't really believed or poo-pooed by, by uh, you know, people who uh, just wish the Bible to be incorrect and there to be no God. And it's interesting when they verify it, but they, they, they took the wheel out, and it's been identified as, as the same, uh, you know, 3000 B.C., because they can verify that through other archaeological uh, chariots and things that they that they were found on land and things like that. And they believe they've got one of the wheels from these war carts or chariots uh, likely was Pharaoh's because... Um, uh, because of the design of it, because they have a, they have another one, that, and so why the the cold salt water there would uh, protect it? Uh, that's that's an interesting. But there's a, a lot of interesting archaeological research that's done that that uh, verifies these scriptural statements that mostly aren't believed. But uh, Mount Zion, where the law was given or, or re-given, we understand that all the law was in place that. And you can see that all in that when you're reading Genesis from the garden. So this isn't new legislation. It's just given again to a people who uh, didn't even know what the day of the week was because the, the pharaohs kept, I believe, it was a nine-day week and uh, worked according to that system. So they, they found out then when they received the manna what day was the correct Sabbath. But they're at this place called, uh, called Mount Sinai. Now this... Um, you have the wave sheaf offering during the days of unleavened bread, which basically is talking about the acceptance of uh, of Israel. Uh, and really, then, as you can see, all of the directions of the Old are directed and fulfilled in Christ, who is the acceptable offering on behalf of Israel. So he is the acceptable offering. And the, of course, this uh, wave sheaf and the barley harvest was the first of the of the harvests or fruits, and Christ is the first of the first fruits. Here on the day of Pentecost, uh, the, the church of God are the, the first fruits. So you'll have the first of the first fruits, Christ, the first fruits, the 144,000 from the 12 tr physical tribes of Israel, and the innumerable or, or great multitude that are added to that, and uh, we'll receive the their inheritance at the at their uh, resurrection. So I mean we all we understand most of that. I just wanted to cover it a little bit before we get going here. So um, I think you'll we all understand this because we're all sort of meat eaters and I don't need to cover the elementary basics of it. So um, uh, the, the commandments were given, but, but principally the thing that took place at Mount Sinai is that. Uh, God made a covenant, which means he made a, a, a contractual offer. So he made an offer, and the people accepted it, and then it was uh, provided for a consideration. And the consideration then was that all of the individuals who, who accepted the offer agreed to keep the terms of the covenant. They agreed to tithe. And the tithe, of course, supported um, Israel was God's first fruits, and the and the uh, funds uh, went to the, the first fruits that were put aside as Levi to be the uh, partly the bureaucrats that managed the health and other features of the system, and the uh, church, which is through the Cohens, uh, um, who received one percent of the gross national product, domestic product, and. The Levi's or bureaucrats received the 9% or retained the 9% because they were then the first first of the first fruits of, amongst Israel because the point of this is that God has to redeem his firstborn. Do you have to redeem your firstborn? God redeemed his firstborn through Christ's sacrifice and paid the penalty for it or paid the cost, not the penalty, for this redemption of his firstborn who were Israel. So you can see now all of that is, is being understood and applied spiritually because it would be difficult to show that in uh, just by reading Deuteronomy and Leviticus, etc. 
But that is what is going on in this matter of understanding the faith, and the faith that was delivered, and then how it's to be applied, and what we need to understand and do in our personal lives as we fulfill the participate in fulfilling the uh, terms of the covenant with uh, guidance from the Holy Spirit that we receive from our baptism. So, Acts 2, I'm going to read a whole section of it here from uh, uh, verses 1 to 21. And also, uh, you know, a point was made last uh, Pentecost that we sometimes are using the term uh, when discussing this, that uh, we use the term when the firstborn were killed in, uh, in Egypt, and, and God's firstborn, Egypt, weren't killed, so none of the Egyptians' children, or, or the, uh, you know, the Israelites themselves, because you could have been a firstborn and be 90 years old, or none of the firstborn of their dogs or cattle or sheep or anything else died, where everything in Egypt died, including the firstborn of, of animals and birds and everything. And we've had a tendency to use a, a term called, you know, calling the, the being that caused this death to take place, the death angel. And uh, jean guy cautioned a bit about that last year because that's good because often we have a tendency just to use words without necessarily being sure we're using them in a correct way that, that uh, which uh, can be uh, perhaps misunderstood because in some places you have it, uh, Jehovah uh, passed over Israel and caused the death of the firstborn of of Egypt and, and uh, all the land and uh, passed over killing the firstborn of the Israelites. So uh, this being who was this, uh, in what some places is called Jehovah and other places is called angel as, uh, as the individual sent by Jehovah to perform a function because we have this angel then coming coming again here at Mount Sinai in Acts 7 you know 7 over 29 to 45 or, or, or so you have uh, this sort of read in, in, uh, in scriptures as to when Moses fled uh, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness at Mount Sinai uh, in the flame of the burning thorn bush and uh, with this uh, with this uh, angel came the voice, voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, the Lord said, take your sandals off, etc. So uh, you have this, uh, this being who was uh, also in the cloud, you know, and as they were being led out of Egypt and, and heading towards the promised land, this angel was in the bush this angel gave the law that we're going to be addressing here shortly, and you can see all that in Acts 7. And he spoke for God. So a lot of what is being addressed here is that um, you have uh, the sin that these uh, Israelites took with them from Egypt, including even the you know the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Rempha, which is uh, represented by the the star that's on the flag of Israel, the, mo the modern nation of, they call themselves Israel, but they're principally Judea, or call themselves Jews. So it's, uh, we have to be careful when we're holding our face and this type of thing that we are sure that there's no pagan images or, not necessarily golden calves, but uh, this type of thing that can maybe have an effect on our correct worship of our God and Father, and it's very difficult. But it's just something to keep in mind as you're uh, as you're preparing and, and uh, keeping the feast and participating in a day like this because it's uh, it's very important. So uh, you'll find a lot of that in Acts uh, seven. But uh, we'll go here to Acts two and read all of one to twenty one. This covers a fair bit of ground here, but I think it, it'll set the course here. Now, when the day of Pentecost is fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. 
And there came unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, they were dwelling um, at uh, Jerusalem, uh, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was uh, spread abroad or noised about, uh, the multitude came together, were confounded, because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled and said to one another, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? And, and they knew that because they had a, had a, a different way of speaking, so, uh, you know, they were understood to be uh, principally from Galilee, or Galilee, the people that were speaking, so, the you know, the difference, we have it in England, you have different pronunciations in different part of the, it. you have it in, this, in the states between the north and the south, to, you know, to a small degree, but it can be extremely pronounced in areas where people aren't moving a lot. And uh, sometimes you, it's very difficult to understand them. So that's the point here. They knew exactly that these were all Galileans speaking, but it was a miracle that they all heard them speak in their own native tongues so there could be no confusion about what they heard. So here we have the receipt of the Spirit by the, by the first fruits of, uh, of, of God according to the terms of the covenant. Given the, the Spirit and uh, provided a miracle to make it plain what was taking place. So I think we all understand that. Uh, we also have this terminology of the of fire, and you're talking about purios, and you know, like the, the lake of fire and the baptism of fire, or, or, or uh, we have a lake of divine cleansing, and this baptism of fire is a, of, uh, of also of divine cleansing. It's related to this because Sometimes there's a tendency when we're thinking physically about some of this to make the lake of fire be an, an incinerator instead of a, a cleansing spiritual, uh, having a cleansing spiritual effect that those that require the second death will be put into and, and cleansed. So uh, studying scripture and being clear on some of the less than great translations is, is a lot of work, but we... Uh, we need to do it so we're sure we understand the plan of God and what he's speaking about. So, as you continue on there in, in Acts 2, uh, there's a list there of all the uh, people that were, were, were uh, Cretes and Arabians. Here we speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying, what means this? So, you know, this is the whole point of the, of the Passover meal. And uh, that uh, a child or an unconverted individual, you know, what's, what is this? What's the meaning of all these rites? And why are we eating bitter herbs and lamb and salt, etc.? And the same thing, it says all people would like to have a better understanding and know these things. However, and typically, you know, as people are deal with us, others said mockingly, these men are full of new wine. They're drunk. Corked or uncorked. So, typically, that's the type of thing there. And Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said, You men of Judea, you do dwell in Jerusalem. Be this known to you. Hearken to my words. These are, are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing it's only the third hour of the day. So it's 9 a.m. in the morning in their local time. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It'll come to pass in the last days... I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. On my servants and my handmaidens, I will pour out in these days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So there's a, a few points here. You know, uh, God's spirit is pour, poured out on um, us after our baptism, and we obtain and accept the the. Um, Christ's sacrifice as payment for our invoice or bill of indebtedness, and then the payment for these sins or, or the, it, the debt for these um, for this invoice is, is paid 100%. Hands are laid on us. We receive the Spirit of God, and then now it becomes participatory as to how you use the Spirit, and uh, as you're explaining the faith uh, that was delivered to people that ask you, 
why you're doing what you're doing and, and what's the reason for it and what does it all mean because you'll be dealt with in exactly the same way that, that these uh, future apostles here and disciples of Christ were treated and, and the uh, and prophets of old were treated as well so we won't get any fa more favorable treatment and probably you've all perhaps lived through the uh, the difficulty with uh, not having had favorable comments from people but you can see if this includes then uh, the sons and daughters will receive the uh, spirit of God and that it will be poured out uh, and what they're calling here is the end days is, should make it clear that the end days just doesn't mean the last jubilee before Christ's return, although the tribulation and everything culminate at that time. But the last days are the last two days of the week. They're, they're the fifth and sixth days of the of the 7,000-year week that uh, God's plan is being being laid, played out here. So in the, these last days is the last 2,000 years, last 40 jubilees. We are now heading into the end of the um, 40th Jubilee. And uh, 40 is what is granted as a period for repentance. So as we come to this being culminated, you can expect a, a, a penalty to fall principally on the lost tribe, uh, you know, 10 tribes of Israel and all of the nations of Israel compounded, uh, but the world at large as well because it's, uh, it's uh, coming into a type of tribulations is going to kill perhaps 90% of human beings on the earth. Uh, we can maybe look up later. There's somewhere where, where God says he will save to himself a, a tithe or a tenth of the population of the planet as, a, as is tied to the tribulation. And we can see if we can find that maybe after service. Part of what we're discussing here is, is to how we use the Holy Spirit, which, uh, which the church had was made available from this day uh, in the first century. So this would be uh, the year 30, uh, the summertime or, or Pentecost. And at this time, they kept the, uh, in Judea at that time in one place, which was at Jerusalem. Although Christ had already pointed out that uh, the time is coming and is now here when you Samaritans won't worship on Mount Gerizim and the Jews won't worship uh, at um, Mount Zion or, or at the physical temple because the physical temple was about to be uprooted and destroyed and not a stone left standing. Uh, you are to uh, worship in spirit and in truth wherever you are on planet Earth. So you'll find yourself in different time zones, in different areas, and we'll have to get together. We're very fortunate now, the, these last 10, 11 years, where we've been able to meet. Sometimes having people join us on the Internet for services from England and, and uh, the continent, even Norway. And uh, here we're, we're meeting with uh, people spread around North America. You know, so we're, we're talking about two and three and, and more thousands of miles spread that we're able to eat, uh, uh, meet. At, uh, at our local time. So uh, this is important, partly because uh, Christ was very clear on that, that you will not worship primarily at, uh, at the temple in Jerusalem because uh, people attempt to start the year with the growth of barley at Jerusalem. Well, the, the growth of barley referenced in, in uh, Exodus was in, uh, was in um, Egypt. And that, those uh, primitive grains do it, grew at a different rate than a lot of these modern barley grains do. And Egypt, they, they generally come to a head two weeks earlier than near Jerusalem. And even more so, the further north into uh, you know, northern Israel you go. So, um, however, the, uh, if that is the case, you see, nobody outside of the Middle East would have a clue when to start the year. Well, these days we can make a phone call or send out an email, but part of the problem in the, in the confusion over the calendar was what do all these other Jews that are spread around different parts of the world, how do they, how do they then know when the start of the year is? They certainly didn't know when the start of the month was, which was the, the new moon. 
because the Pharisees at, at Christ's time, this is all referenced in the Mishnah, uh, began uh, looking for a, a, a sliver, a crescent moon, and had to have witnesses identified from Jerusalem. And then there was no way to get the information out. They tried to light varying fires. There was a conflict because the Samaritans were lighting their fires, notifying the Samaritan populations of when the conjunction was. So they were, be, they were being condemned by the Pharisees because they were lighting confusing fires. Well, they were identifying the conjunction, which the Samaritans have kept for, you know, 26, 25, 2600 years, uh, to their population. So there was no confusion there. It was the Pharisees that were causing the confusion by lighting these fires according to when somebody saw a sliver or a crescent. And it's been validated and verified today with, you know, with the satellite disks and everything else that it's impossible and cannot be done to uh, publish the dates and the, and the times of when the crescent moon should be seen. Uh, hopefully that, then it isn't a cloud cover. So this uh, calendar issue and these days are, are very important. But I just want to cover that a bit because there was no way to know when the, the harvest would be coming due. And Christ said, uh, not at Jerusalem, but in spirit and truth we are to worship. So we have to make sure we're following a correct calendar for the correct reasons. I thought about it with the spiritual application should should make it clear to to us all. Although, as we just uh, realize, it's, it's contestable by people that really don't give it enough uh, crack thought or perhaps haven't done it long enough. A lot of these things, when you make a change from from uh, crescent worship and other types of things, or not worshiping the crescent necessarily, although uh, many people do, but the the Karaites and others that, that just are, are, that's their understanding as to when they need to start their month. They can't publish a calendar for their brethren that are spread around the world because they've been driven out and persecuted by the modern rabbinical authorities. I think they had a death sentence on them from uh, since about the 11th century from uh, Maimonides, who's one of these supposed uh, elder brothers in the faith, which, who he isn't, and he isn't. He's a Talmudist. So I uh, just uh, want to make a few of these points that we can discuss in a bit more detail later that we all uh, need to understand. Now, the, the gifts of the Spirit are recorded. So I'm just going to read a few, a few verses here related to this because, um, as you saw, how Paul understood and addressed it. So uh, Galatians 5, 22 to 26 is a, a nice complete one. This isn't intended to be study on the Holy Spirit or gifts of the Spirit or the calendar or anything. I just wanted to make a few highlights, any points uh, on this once we're done. So, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit, that means you've received the Spirit, you haven't quenched it, you possess it, it's actively working in you, you are using it and fulfilling the spiritual terms of keeping the covenant of God. R. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So that's quite a list. Against such things there is no law. Wherever you have a law, you'll have a penalty for its breach. That sometimes is used to show that the law of God is done away because there's no such things against the law. Or such things there is no law. That what is meant by this in, in the Greek is there's no penalty for when there's no breach. So the fact that Gentiles may be keeping portions of, of the covenant, there's no penalty for them for what they kept. There is and may well be an, an, uh, a penalty for their breach, although they're dealt with differently because they're not under judgment at this time. But sometimes these... Uh, Breaches of the law bring their own penalties regardless. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desire. If we live by the Spirit, let's walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another and envying one another. So we've all seen uh, lots of that over the last 10 years. 
and uh, and there, there's just a, no reason to, because everybody has the same inheritance. There's no differences in the inheritance. We have the same inheritance that we've received from the will from Jesus Christ's death, and what position or other there are a little bit two of Christ's disciples are a little bit debating about wanting this or that executive position, and he told them it's not his to give. You know, chastise them a bit for even bringing that up. But that's the, the natural physical way of thinking and physical mind. So we have to be careful of that and implement all of the first part of the list here that are all good things and would, um, you know, bring, uh, bring positive comments to people when they understand the faith that you're exhibiting and here's what you do with it. Because most people uh, that are sort of Bible thumping generally just go around yelling at everybody and or telling them they're stupid, that type of thing. And that's not our job to do that. Just is to be witnesses and, uh, for doing it the way God wants us done is difficult enough. So 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 14, I can read this whole bit as well, because it's talking about spiritual gifts received from baptism, initially received then at the, at, uh, from Mount Sinai, having been made available. Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by dumb idols. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, as Christ pointed out, many people at, at, at the time he was, uh, was uh, speaking and, and traveling around, called him Lord. They wanted him to be Lord. They wanted him to initiate the kingdom in Judea at that time. Uh, and, and he pointed out to them, well, why do you keep calling me Lord and don't do what I tell you? Most of Protestantism calls Jesus Lord and, and this type of thing and make a big, uh, a big use of words about it and then say, oh, yes, but, uh, you, you know, uh, you don't have to uh, keep the, all of the terms of the covenant. When you read him, you know, Matthew, and point out that he said uh, that uh, none of the terms of the covenant are, are removed, or they won't be removed if, if heaven and earth is still here, they must be here. Still, that's uh, the type of double talk that you'll have to deal with. So no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Five or six million, hundred million Protestants endlessly say Jesus is Lord and then say you don't have to keep the law and keep the terms of the covenant. So then people will say, oh, we'll see the Bible's just a confusing mishmash because here it says no one can say it except the Spirit. So because we say Jesus is Lord or you're only baptized in, in the name of uh, Yahashua, uh, this type of thing, um, or, or, the, or your baptism is invalid. So... Anyway, hopefully we all are understanding that, that how the words are used is, is, and how you can have to explain them or at least understand them is very important. So we'll continue on here, verse 4. Uh, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works in all things and all persons. And this the varieties of ministries. Um, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement over Mark. And they, they divided company and went off in, into different areas to do to continue the work under a different uh, ministerial authorization. And you can see, though, that Barnabas was proved to be correct, even though he, he wasn't the person that Paul was. He was correct because Paul later asked for Barnabas to send a mark back because he was so healthy, uh, um, helpful. Uh, to him and to his work after Paul was bordering on disfellowshipping him because he'd done a few things wrong. Well, Paul did a few things wrong, and uh, everybody does a few things wrong. And yet, you can see here, varieties of ministries, same Jesus Christ overseeing what we're doing and monitoring it, varieties of effects, and the same God who works all things in all persons, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to one another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, 
to another the effects of miracles, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But it is the one and the same spirit that works in all these things distributed to each one individual just as he wills. So hopefully that, that should be fairly clear, right? There can be everybody have different gifts and skills. And some do it better and some of us do it a bit less. Some of us do things not very well. Well, we all make an effort to improve, hopefully, and then that's the end of the problem. We don't need to judge in that way. You do need to discriminate. And you do need to make sure you're judging correctly. But you don't need to make a spiritual judgment about what somebody else may or may not be doing unless it's obviously sin but not the grades of doing good shouldn't be getting a judge by and that's what he was talking about earlier in this uh, rowdy speaking and envy which uh, human beings suffer from so continuing verse 11 uh, for us the one and the same spirit works in all these things distributing to each one individually just as he wills he uh, sorry I shouldn't have even read that each one uh, just as it wills there's a Trinitarian translation here I, uh, that they're where they're making the Spirit of God part of the Trinity. So the Spirit of God is the essence that, with which he works with this physical, sinful creation. You cannot be in the presence of the one true God and live. You die. You can't be in his presence and live. He will be coming to earth after all the... Uh, all this uh, rebellion is put down and Christ has put it down, he will come to earth. Can you imagine? Now, that's a, the new heavens and the new earth as, as well here, but the point is he uses a mechanism from the Spirit which is works in the world and is given to the called ones. Jesus Christ was born through the activity of the Spirit. God Almighty didn't come to the earth and can't because we'd all be dead. We can't live in his presence, and he's working out something different. So you have uh, God the Father. You have all of the spirit world that uh, was his first creation, and first created dimension. A lot of these spirit beings' responsibilities were to work with the physical creation, and they failed in, in doing that. Jesus Christ was the spirit or God or, or king, king of Israel or God of Israel. Uh, who was given responsibility for Israel and fulfilled it. But he, he didn't fulfill it in a way that the Israelites of 2,000 years ago or the Jews uh, wanted him to because they're interested in, in a, a physical benefit and, and reconciliation and redemption. We look forward to a, a spiritual one that will be forever because it's the inheritance that all human beings should be receiving. So we all have the same inheritance. There's no better or, or, you know, the first resurrection is better than the first because of the gifts that are tied to that. So that's why we are doing this effort to attain to the first resurrection. But if we don't, uh, we'll be in the second and can uh, do whatever uh, things we we perhaps should have done in this life and failed in or gave up for one, what reason or another. And so this is the spirit that... that God Almighty works in with his physical creation. And the spiritual creation or the physical creation doesn't die from possessing a spirit. So it will come into you after your baptism and the laying on of hands. It will remain with you as long as you're working with it and, and making an effort to uh, keep the terms of the agreement, the contract you, you signed or made, sealed uh, from your baptism and receiving his spirit. We can quench it, so we can sin, and that can sometimes not necessarily be something you actually act, you know, went and did. It can be what you're thinking, because what what is as important here is it's what we're thinking that it is uh, compounded when you're receiving the Spirit of God as to how you how you keep His law. The fact that you didn't commit physical adultery is it's very nice, and it's good, or there'd be a penalty for it. When you receive the Spirit of God, you can't even think about doing it. 
Well, suddenly the law is termed magnified, but the responsibility in keeping the law with the Spirit of God is magnified manifold. So when you first started keeping the, uh, you know, the Sabbath, as you're, as you're driving to services or going somewhere, you, you'd be trying to keep all of the uh, business matters out of your head on that day as much as possible. And the more you try you, to do that, the more successful you'll find you are. Uh, you know, thinking improper thoughts about um, about if you're married and you're thinking about it, uh, you're guilty. Well, we have to understand the law needs to be kept this way. So whether you're talking about certain fairly simple physical things, you have to put the spiritual application of what it is that God wants you to be doing and thinking about in that matter. Because this is generally not uh, kept that way and it's and it's really important so this, this is a feature that's not properly understood i just want to bring it out a bit um, for this morning so i think uh, perhaps we could uh, close with that and then maybe discuss some of these things because i know i uh, um, brought a lot out here and uh, it's, i think it's fairly important because i'm not sure that people at large understand it really and um, because we do make a, a big fuss about the physical components, and we have to make sure we're doing the physical things correctly, and then uh, don't give much uh, thought to the spiritual application of the law. And, uh, and to please keep in mind, what did Christ say? Neither on Mount Gerizim nor on, on Mount Zion at Jerusalem, uh, the law will be kept in spirit and truth wherever you are on planet Earth. It will not be kept on Jerusalem. So whether they rebuild the temple, whenever that takes place, and all these things take place, we'll have to see when it, when it, when uh, the effect of it is, or what is allowed to be done, or what is caused to be done by God. But for the interim, this past 2,000 years, so we're coming to a conclusion of these 40 jubilees. And so we're co coming to this opportunity for repentance. The Jews got 40 years from A.D. 30, or Common Era 30 common year of 70, then they were, the temple was destroyed and they were mostly killed. They were given 40 years. So the planet Earth has been given 40 jubilees. It's uh, coming to a head and uh, it's hard to see exactly how many years it'll be before the tribulation uh, comes upon us, but uh, we're not worried about it. We're not we don't like it, and we try to caution people that there's another way to do things instead of the way they're doing them, but we're not afraid of it. And uh, our responsibility is to publish what we can so that people are able to have a, an understanding of if you're going to live this way, here's what you can expect. Um, and uh, so anyway, we'll, I think we'll close with that, and then we can uh, just discuss a few of these points on the the spiritual application of the law. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, James. As always, we appreciate your insight into these uh, studies, always bringing out uh, key points that uh, cause us to uh, give it more thought. So uh, with that, we will have our final hymn, which can be found, if you all stand please, on page 105. It's a hymn that comes from Psalm 139, titled, Where Shall I Go From Your Spirit, O Yah? After which, I'd like to call upon Mr. Eric Aristide to please close in prayer. So page 105, Where Shall I Go From Your Spirit, O Yah?
Okay, if you will all remain standing, I'd like to call upon Mr. Eric Aristide to please close in prayer. Eric? Can you hear me? Yep. Heavenly Father, thank you for this precious opportunity you give us to be again online in this day of Pentecost to learn always more about you and your kingdom. Please grant us your Holy Spirit in this special feast day. Open our mind to the understanding of your word. Help us not only to learn, but to remember and live according to your ordinances. May our way of life prove that we are truly and obviously children of the Almighty God. Bless us and bless the remainder of this day. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, our King to come. Amen.